Saluete, Vietores, and welcome back to Let's Translate Eutropius's Breviarium Historiae Romanae of Urbe Condita. Last time we read about two more warlike kings, Tullus Hostilius, who was king during the Horati legend, and Ancus Marcius, who built the city of Ostia and added two more hills to Rome's collection. This time, we begin De Inde Regnum, Priscus Tarquinius. Uh, so we have not actually seen this before, and I'm, I'm going to be talking about pronunciation for a second. So, I would immediately think of this as Akepit. That, that's my immediately immediate thought for pronouncing this word. Uh, though I have taken a look at my Latin books, and I believe it should be Akepit. Pronouncing it like that. Like, uh, one of the examples that uh, is given is bookkeeper? Similar to that. Except I kind of sometimes, in fact, most of the time, usually pronounce bookkeeper as bookkeeper. So, kind of a conundrum, but if I want to be closer to classical Latin, it would be akkepit. It's similar to how uh, we have seen double I's before, and I try to pronounce both of them, like with imperi. It's just two consonants with that sound is much more weird to me. But I will do my best to try to pronounce it as intended with classical Latin. I know that it's different for medieval Latin, and uh, I don't know if the sounds have changed by this point in the 4th century. I don't know exactly when each of the different uh, sounds changes, because they do, between uh, classical Latin, which is focused on the late Republic, Cicero's Day, or Cicero's Day, if you want to pronounce it like that, and uh, medieval Latin, or also called church Latin. But, yeah, I'm just going to be trying to keep the classical pronunciation as much as I can. So it would be Akkepit. So, De Inde Regnum Priscus Tarquinius Akkepit. Uh, so, verb. Priscus Tarquinius is our subject, and Regnum is our object. De Inde is a conjunction, we have seen before. Uh, so here would be afterwards, or you could say then, but I think afterwards works better. Priscus Tarquinius accepted uh, power, or rule. You could say rule as well. Hic numerum senatorum duplicavit. Uh, numerum is our object with senatorum in the genitive, modifying it with possession. That's, I guess it's possession. Uh, whatever. It's still modifying it. Uh, and then heek. This is, once again, we saw this two chapters ago. Actually, yeah, two chapters ago, which is still last episode. Uh, the difference between hick and heek. This is, once again, heek. So it's here. And in fact, I think he's sort of using it... Before I had translated this as... Uh, he doubled the number of senators here. But I think the here is meant for... Uh, like, during his reign. Like, here, at this point, that kind of thing. Also, duplicawit, it can mean double. But... I've also been thoroughly confused about the number of senators previously. Not, I don't think it's shown up in a recording, though. Uh, but just, I hadn't really... I didn't really make note as to why Tullus Hostilius built the Curia Hostilia. It's because he accepted a bunch of the... Like, bringing all of the people from Alba Longa to Rome... He, he uh, invited a lot of the nobles to be senators, and so increased the number of senators. Which is also what Prisca Starquinius is doing right now. And I do cursory glances at Wikipedia to sort of refresh my memory on the kings of Rome, because I don't really focus on them much. But uh, since I didn't, hadn't realized that 
Hostilios had increased the number of senators. I was like, 300? Because they listed it as 300. That's weird. I thought it would be 200. And that would make this double. Since he adds 100 senators. Livy says he adds 100 senators. So 100 plus 100, that's doubling. But no. He's just adding 100 senators. So duplicawit, I would not translate as double. I would just say increase. So here, he increased the number of senators. I don't know why I have trouble with this. Idafikawit. Idafikawit, really. Kirkum Romai. This is definitely possession, though. Do -do -do. Uh, he built a circus, or the circus of Rome, aka the Circus Maximus. Ludos Romanos Instituit. Once again, our verb. Romanos is an is an adjective modifying ludos, and ludos is our object. And he instituted the Roman games, a specific set of games that were particularly special to the Romans. Qui, relative clause, ending the sentence. Qui ad nostram, prepositional phrase, permanent. And that's our verb. So, uh, which, and Ludos Romanos is the antecedent to qui. That's what it's referring to, or that's what it's relative of. So, wit, the Roman games, which, permanent, this means persist, not that it is permanent. Ad nostram memoriam. So, this literally means to our memory which persist to our memory. What is meant by that is, like, the memory of... Like, the Roman games are in the memory of the current people alive because they are still ongoing. They still happen. It's just a really awkward way to say it, at least for modern English speakers. So, I have seen this actually translated as to our day or to the present day. I think I'm still going to keep it as to our memory, to one, be closer to the to what's actually being said in the Latin. But and two, I kinda like how that's phrased. I think it's interesting. I think it's just a really interesting way to phrase that. But to go over the whole sentence, here he increased the number of senators he built the circus of rome he instituted the roman games which persist to our memory or day wicket idem etiam sabinos et non parum agrorum sublatum istem orbes romae territorio yunxit so wicket and yunxit are are verbs in this sentence. Wicket. Uh, etiam is an adverb, just meaning like furthermore. Uh, and also that kind of thing. So furthermore, he conquered or defeated Edem, the same, Sabinos, Sabines. And uh, Yonksit, he joined non parum agrorum sublatum. I'm not sure exactly how to mark this up, honestly. I'm pretty sure sublatum is like the direct object here. Agrorum is in the genitive, genitive plural, but I don't know exactly what it's meant to be modifying. I, the way I have figured to translate this, it would kind of be mod like a, a sort of, uh... so basically I say, Parum is a, like, insignificant or small. So, non parum, a not small. And then I would imply, like, amount or part, agrorum, of the fields, sublatum. That's a uh, perfect passive participle, having been taken. So, like, a bunch of the, or even agrorum, you, I could say, you could say lands. A bunch... 
a not small part of the lands having been taken. As in, like, taken during the war. I, I, I'm not sure exactly how to mark Parum and Agrorum, though. I, I feel like it might be this. I'm not sure, though. And then, Istem Orbis Romae Territorio. So, Istem and Territorio, they are both in the dative, so they are working together. Orbis and Romae are both genitive, but Orbis is modifying Territorio, while Romae is modifying Orbis. Quite the connection of lines and arrows there. But this little phrase is just to the same territory of the city of Rome. So he he connected or joined a not small part, or you could translate it as a large part or a great part, but I'm keeping it like this, closer to the Latin, of the lands having been taken to the same territory of the city of Rome. Basically, he added a bunch of Sabine land to Rome's territory. And then, primusque triumphans urbem entrawit. Another little thing of pronunciation. Uh, P-H, T-H, and C-H. None of them do, like, their weird chain, change it to a completely different sound. Uh, so, it's not triumphans, it is triopans. Or triumphans. Triumphans. Mm. It is triumphans. You put more... It's the same sound as that first letter, but then you add more of a breath from the H. So, I, we will see CH later. That is K. PH is P. And TH, which I don't believe we have seen yet, is T. You just add more of a breath. Though, uh, again, this may have actually changed by Eutropius' time. But we've got our verb in intrawit. Urbem is our object. Primus and triumphans. This is a uh, a present active participle, as opposed to the perfect passive. So they both primus and triumphans are mod basically modifying the subject, as they're both in the nominative. Basically saying, uh, and, que, uh, the first triumphing, he entered the city. And that's a really awkward way to put it. Because, like, the first triumphing, like, in a war? But it's really referring to uh, the big parade, the big procession, that the Romans called a triumph for, well, triumphal generals. It's that special cultural thing that the Romans have. Uh, Eutropius is saying that he, Prisca Tarquinius was the first one to do that. Though other authors do say that Romulus was the first one, but whatever. Uh, I have seen this translated better as he entered the city, being the first to celebrate a triumph. But I think I at least have, uh, and him, like, and him the first to celebrate a triumph, he entered the city. I think that would be, that that's what I'm going to go with, just to at least have Primus and Triopans still being before Orbem Intrawit. But, yeah. It's just somewhat... It just got to make it sound better in English. So for the whole sentence, uh, furthermore, he conquered the same Sabines, and he joined a not small part of the lands, having been taken, to the same territory of the city of Rome. And, uh, being the first to celebrate a triumph, he entered the city. So already, Priscus Tarquinius has done quite a few things. He has. He has grown the Senate. He has built 
and it, at least the foundations for an incredible entertainment complex, as well as uh, started some very big entertainment for the games. And he has also fought and defeated the Sabines, again, taking a bunch of their territory, and supposedly started the tradition of the Triumph. And he's going to do even more. Muros fecit et cloacas, Capitolium in, Coa in Coawit. So, fecit is our verb here. Cloacas and muros are objects, and we've got... Yeah, I'll mark this. Capitolium is an object, as and in Coawit is our verb in this second part. So he built, or made, yeah, more specifically made, walls, or you could say the walls, and the sewers. And just as the circus is going to come known as the come to be known as the Circus Maximus, these sewers are going to become known as the Cloaca Maxima. The the great sewer. And at least help keep Rome clean, though it's going to be still a, an incredibly dirty city. And then he began the Capitolium. The Capitolium being a great temple to Jupiter on the Capitol Hill. Which I can only assume, since we haven't had the Capitol Hill mentioned until now, that he took it with the Sabine territory? I can only assume, since Eutropius mentions when each when each hill becomes part of Rome. But, yeah, he made the walls and the sewers... He began the Capitolium, the Temple of Jupiter. Which is not going to be finished for quite some time. Tricesimo ottavo imperii anno per anchi filios oc cesus est regis eus qui ipse suc caserat. I'm not... Okay, I'm going to be honest. I'm not going to even try pronouncing the S's differently. Like, I'll give it one shot. That's so weird. That's so weird. Uh, so, correct me if I I should be pronouncing both S's separately. But that's just that's just even a bit too far for me. But we've got more ablative of, of time one in the thirty eighth year of his reign. Per anki filios, prepositional phrase. Oc quesus est, uh, once again, perfect passive participle. So, in the 38th year of his reign, he was killed through the sons of Ancus. So, here, I'm not sure why, but Eutropius is substituting an ablative of agent with pair plus the accusative. They kind of just mean the same thing. Just describing who's doing this action. But I, I, I just don't know why he would do that. But because of that, you can also translate pair as by. Like, he was killed by the sons of Ancus. And then Regus Eus is in apposition yeah is in apposition to Anki just helping describe in a different way Ankos his king and I can only assume his it being Prescus Tarquinius and then Kui is actually relative a relative pronoun in the dative form of Kui So who, and it's in the dative because Sukkeserat takes the dative. Oh wait, oh we have seen double C's before because we did. There was a uh, Suk in the chapter four for Tolus Australius. So we have seen that before actually. But this is in the pluperfect, so he had succeeded. 
him, or whom he had succeeded, I should say. In fact, it is whom he himself, Ipse, has succeeded. So the whole sentence is, in the 38th year of his reign, he was killed by the sons of Ancus, his king, whom he himself had succeeded. Also, good old fighting over the succession of the throne. Ah, I had been wondering when that was going to happen because it's almost inevitable with any kind of monarchy. That also continues our little pattern. So we've got Romulus dying violently in a storm, or, you know, becoming a god, but eh. And then we've got Numa Popilius dying peacefully of natural causes. We've got Tullus Hostilius, who dies violently via lightning and burning. We've got Ancus Marcius, who dies peacefully in, by natural causes. And now we've got Priscus Tarquinius, who dies violently via murder. We've only got two kings left, so we'll see if this pattern still holds up. But at least the pattern isn't acts of God and dying, peace, dying of natural causes anymore. Now it's just violent and natural. And with that, I'd actually like to talk about something else before going to the Latin and English readings. In fact, I want to talk about the backgrounds of each of these kings. So I just wanted to quickly talk about the background of Tarquinius Priscus. And in fact, I want to address the backgrounds of all of these Roman kings, because most of them are definitely not native Romans. They were not born in Rome or its controlled territory. Romulus, of course, was from Alba Longa, but he's the founder of the city, so he's kind of Roman by default, since he is Mr. Rome. Numo Popilius was a Sabine, living in the Sabine town of Cores, before being chosen as king. Tullus Hostilius, I can only assume, was a native Roman, as I have found no evidence to the contrary. Plus, uh, I believe uh, either his father or grandfather was a friend of Romulus. Then Ancus Marcius, he could have been born in Rome, but being the grandson of Numa, he had Sabine ancestry, so he could have also been born in Sabine territory. And now here, Tarquinius Priscus is Etruscan. His descendant, Tarquinius Superbus, will also be Etruscan, and so is his direct successor, Servius Tullius. And by that, I mean Servius Tullius is the successor of Tarquinius Priscus. Then comes Tarquinius Superbus. But, whatever. But in fact, Servius Tullius, he is thought to have been a freed slave. So, with all of this, the seven kings of Rome are often referred to as legend, and as legends usually serve a sort of purpose, like a moral or some such, I think one can interpret the seven kings' differing backgrounds as showing that Romans can come from anywhere. They can be any one, no matter their their birthplace or their status, their their social status. Roman citizenship throughout Rome's history continued to be expanded from those who lived just in the city of Rome to Latin allies to other Italian allies and eventually to anyone who lived within Rome's borders. I just think it's an interesting notion and one that kind of... Uh, it, it's sort of like a predecessor of the idea of how anyone can sort of be American. It doesn't necessarily have to, anything to do with your bloodline or your birthplace, though those can certainly be important to your identity. And I'm trying to be brief with this, so I'm not going to go into any more detail, but I thought it was just an interesting idea to put out there. Anyways, onto the full Latin and English readings of this chapter. Dein de regnum priscus Tarquinius ac capit, hic numerum seditorum duplicavit. Circum Romae, Idefecawit, 
Ludos Romanos instituit qui ad nostra memoriam permanent. Wicket idem etiam sabinos, et non parum agrorum sublatum istem orbis Romae territorio iuxit. Muros frecit et cloacas, Capitolium in coavit, tercesimo octavo imperi anno per anci filios, hoc quisus est, regus eus, qui ipse suc gesserat. Afterwards, Tarquinius Priscus accepted power. Here, he increased the number of senators, he built the circus of Rome, he instituted the Roman games which persist to our memory. Furthermore, he defeated the same Sabines and joined a not small amount of their lands, having been taken to the same territory of the city of Rome. And, him being the first to celebrate a triumph, he entered the city. He built the walls and the sewers, he began the Capitolium Temple. In the 38th year of his reign, he was killed by the sons of Ancus, his king, whom he himself had succeeded. Until next time, we will read about the second to last king of Rome, though, from what I've heard, he is a pretty good one. Well, it did, we are